Victor Templeton Bryan was born in Arima on August 26, 1907. He grew up with his grandfather, Nestor Moreno, who owned a farm in the Guayco Cunapo area. His grandfather was Spanish speaking, his father French speaking, and his mother spoke both French and Spanish. Victor grew up speaking both tongues, but English was his acquired language because his parents insisted he speak it in order to go to school. During his political career in the eastern counties in the 1950s, a lot of the inhabitants were still French and Spanish speaking, and this was a communicative skill which Victor Bryan, the politician, used to his advantage. So he could speak very good English when it was required. He could speak Patois when it was required. And then if he had to break into the dialect between the English and the Patois, he did that with absolute ease and fluency. And therefore he endeared himself to everybody in the constituency because by the way he spoke, he could, he could make contact with, with everyone. He received his early education at a Rima Boys Roman Catholic school and later went on to attend St. Mary's College. In 1922, he was employed as a junior clerk at the public library. Victor left and later joined the Trinidad Police Force in 1924, where, on being told that as a colored man, he would not be promoted in any significant manner, he quickly resigned. In 1927, he went to Venezuela to serve in the oil companies. In 1931, he returned to Trinidad and joined the Antilles Petroleum Company Limited, where he was the private secretary to the general manager till 1942. After that, he retired to start his own business, Popsicle Concessions and the Trinidad Import and Export Company. Brian was a member of the Arima Borough up to 1946 when he contested the general elections, the very first under universal adult suffrage. Brian ran as a candidate of the Socialist Party of Trinidad and Tobago, the SPTT, and won his seat. His party captured two of nine seats, the other going to Clarence Carmichael Abid. The elections were held on Monday, July 1st of that year, when Victor won his seat for the eastern counties, which included St. Andrew, St. David, Nariva, and Mayaro, roughly about 75,000 constituents. They were made up of French Creoles and a large East Indian population. He did not seem to see race in, in his dealing with his constituents. He, he, he was blind to the question as to whether you were African or you were Indian or Chinese. Once you were his constituent, you, you, you were a person. And I think that, that genuine inability to see persons in terms of ethnicity um, was read by the constituents. You know, those people, they might not be too educated, but you can't fool them very easily. And if you are not genuine, they very soon determine the fact that you are just putting on an act. But I think in his case, from, 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 from the very outset, they saw someone who was genuine and who did not see them in the ethnic components, in the ethnic compartments, and, and therefore they warmed to him. You see, you also have to think of the fact that the village in which he grew up, Nestor Village, um, way up in the, in the heights of Tamana, is, is a very multi-ethnic uh, village, a very multi-ethnic community. So that he grew up in a community where there were a lot of cocoa pineals, there were a lot of East Indian, um, farmers, um, there, there were a number of, of, of persons um, of African descent who after slavery had, had gone up in those hilly areas and were planting um, cocoa and, and citrus fruits and coffee and so on. So it was a very mixed community. So I think that having grown up in, in a kind of a, uh, a micro, multi-ethnic society, Brian's victory at the polls in an area with so many East Indians is attributed to his knack for meeting people at their level. Constituents saw Brian as one of their own. In fact, he would lime by the river with people from the eastern counties. He was a member of the Legislative Council from 1946 to 1950 and from 1950 to 1955 and was the first Minister of Agriculture and Lands from 1950 to 1956. While in the Legislative Council, 
Brian was an ardent fighter for political reform and lobbied for the Federation of the West Indies. In December 1946, Victor's tenacious nature was demonstrated when he and his colleague, Dr. Patrick Solomon, were the only two out of 18 members of the Legislative Council to support a motion which stated, quote, this council is of the opinion that responsible government should be granted immediately to Trinidad and Tobago, unquote. He was the mover who called for the federation, but declared that federation must be subordinate to full responsible government and must not delay the advancement to self-government. Brian was echoing Captain Cipriani, who in 1933 declared, no federation without self-government, and on this we stand or fall. So Brian, along with his radical colleagues, Patrick Solomon, APT James, Ranjit Kumar, and Chanka Maraj, advanced the notion of constitutional reform. After much debate with positions moving back and forth between England and Trinidad, a new constitution was announced on Wednesday, January 19, 1949, to a tense and anxious nation by the then colonial secretary, Governor Sir John Shaw. The Legislative Council, among other changes, would now consist of 18 elected members from the previous nine. In the September 18, 1950 general elections, Bryan fought for the Eastern Counties a second time and won as a result of his popularity among grassroots people. The election was a significant event as it opened the door for a ministerial government. Indeed, Victor Bryan's triumph brought a carnival-like atmosphere to Sangri Grande. The official opening of the new legislature took place on Friday, October 20th, 1950. And on that day, in accordance with the Constitution, the legislature elected five members to the Executive Council, also known as the Knox Street Quintet. Albert Gomes, Victor Bryan, Roy Joseph, Norman Tang, and Ajoda Singh. On October 24, 1950, they received their portfolios. Brian, together with four of his radical colleagues, made history by becoming the first ministers in Trinidad and Tobago. Brian became the first minister of agriculture and lands, Roy Joseph, the minister of education, Albert Gomes, minister of labor, Norman Tang, minister of health, and Ajoda Singh, minister of works. But according to Lionel Sukaran, Victor Bryan's acceptance of his post was viewed as a gross betrayal since Bryan was thought to be softening on his position on self-government. Bryan believed he could do much more from inside the corridors of power. No, I, I, I don't agree with that point of view at all. I think it was <coughs> even, even on, I mean, I don't see how his acceptance of the position of Minister of Agriculture had anything to do with his larger federal vision. I think they were, they were, they were two separate matters. On the one hand, he represented an agricultural constituency. That was the occupation of 90% of those whom he represented. <coughs> he had himself come from an agricultural family in an agricultural village, so that, so that his whole life was tied up uh, with, with agriculture. And therefore, um, this, is, this, this was the consideration that the governor had in mind when he said, whom shall I appoint as minister of agriculture? And he looked at uh, Brian's background and said, this is a suitable person, and indeed he was. So I don't think it was a betrayal of anybody or anything. What we also have to bear in mind that at the same time that he was working in Trinidad and Tobago for the betterment of people of Trinidad and Tobago, he also had a larger federal vision. He was a federalist, and he believed, like Albert Gums and many others, that, that individually the islands could achieve very little on, on, on the world stage. But that if we came together, the whole of the, the, the British Caribbean would have had one voice, one united and therefore stronger voice to parley, to bargain with, with, with international organizations and with big countries and so on. And he was quite clear in that vision. Nevertheless, in Lionel Sukaran's biography, he praised the quintet. We have only to look around us to see how much they achieved with so little. These monuments, the Lady Young Highway, the Beetham Highway, the General Hospital, they are testimony to the dedication of five tall, uncrowned men who rose above the fog of private and public dealings. 
Brian's previous career before his entry into politics did not in any significant way involve agriculture, though he grew up with his grandfather, Nestor Moreno, who owned a farm in the Guayco Kunapu area, which was later named the Nestor Village in his honor. Brian became deeply moved by the problems which afflicted farmers in his county. And his ministerial duties from um, 56 to six, no, 50 to 56, that is when he was Minister of Agriculture, those ministerial duties did not prevent him from making regular contact with, with, with people. And I think uh, most people remember him in the constituency of, well, the Eastern Counties, Nariva Mayaro. Most people remember him for the fact that he is the first one, really, who started development in the Nariva Swamp, converting thousands of acres of swampland into very good uh, rice cultivation. And he initiated a scheme of distribution of land in five-acre parcels to the, the, the rice farmers in the area. And once he saw that after a year or two you were doing well, he would, he would arrange to so get another five acres so that those who were hardworking became more prosperous because he, he rewarded hard work. And when I became representative in that particular area in 1986, all the people were telling me, we hope that you follow in Victor Bryan's footsteps and further develop the Nariva Swamp, which I tried to do. But whatever I did was really on the foundation of the excellent work that he had started, converting an area that was, you know, for 24 uh, weeks in the year, covered with, with flood and, and water, converting that, draining it, making, making polders in the area, providing roads into areas like Plumita and Navet and, and Ecclesville, all of which entered the swamp. So, so, so he made access to the swamp possible. Um, he built the infrastructure that made cultivation possible. And he ensured, he ensured that once the people produced their rice, that, that, that he had a good market for them. And that is where his, his acumen as a businessman uh, you know, sh showed its effect, because he would direct them where to go in Port of Spain, where to go in San Fernando and, and sell their rice so that uh, people didn't just produce rice, he ensured that right down to the end of the crop that they had means of, of disposing it. And I think that was a very significant contribution to the development of Eastern Trinidad, which is, which is uh, you know, not often remembered. Indeed, in 1952, Brian brought a bill to the council to allow the cremation of the dead, a bill meant to benefit the East Indian population who did not practice the interment of their dead. Hindus in particular, as well as the Hindus from, from the rest of Trinidad and Tobago, f were for a very long time, I would say about a hundred years previously, these Hindus having come from India were always agitating for the right to cremate their dead. And, 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 and when he became the representative for an area that had a large number of Hindus, they pressed him equally that this is something we want because we are, we are forced by the law to bury our dead, which is not in the, in the proper Hindu tradition. And amazingly, Victor Brand took the matter up in the Legislative Council on behalf of his Hindu constituents, but I would say also on behalf of, of, of the larger Hindu population of Trinbago, and, and brought the matter to the Parliament in 1952 and the, the various uh, East Indian representatives on the council, the legislature, they, they, they very strongly supported him. And so it was largely as a result of his initiative that cremation was legalized in Trinidad in 1952. And that was a tremendous boon for the Hindu community, um, who, as I said, had been agitating for it. He had offered himself to the electorate as one whose interest was to improve the welfare of the common man and he wanted to make Trinidad and Tobago a better place. He was charged with the responsibility of being the Minister of Agriculture and Lands and threw himself into the task with characteristic energy and enthusiasm. A food production drive was launched under his ministry and the policy of balanced agriculture, that is, of land being put to use best suited for it, was introduced. Price control of local food was lifted and guaranteed prices offered to farmers. A rice officer was appointed and land settlements expanded to meet the incessant demand for land. 
The legislature voted $2.5 million for capital expenditure and loans. The scope of the agricultural bank was extended and cattle imported. Brian had even gone to the police barracks to improve his horse riding so he could wander over rough tracks to meet the common man in his garden or in the forest. In fact, he often rode out to the countryside, clearly demonstrating his personal touch and that knack he had for easy rapport with all whom he met. I think he generally improved agriculture throughout Trinidad and Tobago because that was his baby, that was his most um, important interest. And so, and so agricultural production, so there was increased agricultural production not only in rice, it was a period where one saw um, considerable improvement in the production of cocoa, which at that time was fetching a very good price on the international market. It was a time in which Trinidad exported a good deal of, of excellent bananas after Victor Brand's time, o o all of that um, disappeared. Rice production fell. Cocoa was, was virtually abandoned under the, the PNM. Um, but 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 his legacy remains in, in, in providing agricultural infrastructure throughout the country and getting agricultural subsidies for, for farmers in the various agricultural areas, for letting the farmers feel that they were, they were important people by his um, constant, constantly keeping in touch with them, constantly reassuring them that, that, that here you have someone looking after you. So I think it was a period of, of considerable um, agricultural revival, even in the, in, the, in, the, in the colonial period, even with the competition of the, of the oil industry, even so, he was able to, to ensure prosperity for, for thousands of, of agricultural people um, throughout Trinidad and Tobago. And I can speak as, as someone you know, coming from that area, coming from an agricultural family, which was sustained during Victor Brian's, Brian's time by the, by the good prices he got for agricultural produce. One of his agricultural accomplishments was to turn the river swamp into rice fields. On New Year's Eve 1953, he flew over the rice areas piloted by Sir Harold Robinson to observe its progress. He considered the food drive a success. In 1956, at the first party elections, Victor Bryan joined the Trinidad Labour Party after realizing he would be unable to prevail in the eastern counties on personality alone. He formally abandoned his plan to run as an independent for the new constituency of St. Andrew St. David. He won his seat despite strong pressure coming from a new party, the People's National Movement, led by the young lecturer Dr. Eric Williams. The PNM had made significant inroads in Bryan's constituency, and many believe Bryan was particularly hostile to Dr. Williams. Bryan always felt that Williams was, in a sense, politically irresponsible. Uh, that he was saying things which derived from book knowledge. He felt Williams was really. Uh, he was brilliant academically, but he was politically immature. I think that would be Brian's judgment of Williams, that he, and, and that he also catered to the middle class, the, the black middle class, more than Brian thought he did. So he had an, a number of issues with Williams. One was his Williams presumed attack on the Catholic Church. He, in the 56 campaign, he complained a lot about Williams' irresponsibility, you know, uh, his, the kinds of positions he was taking in respect of the church, birth control, uh, and all those issues which were important at the time. Uh, he also felt that Williams, uh, I, I don't know if he really believed it, but he, he felt, he, he spoke as though he did, that Williams was socialist. In a predominantly Catholic area, Brian used the communist taunt to discredit the PNM. But on the question of the Catholicism thing, um, Brian, as did Gums, as did, as did the POPPG, all branded Williams as a communist, 
or at least a socialist, that they were hostile to the Catholic Church, that he was totalitarian, that he was Nazi. All of those things Brian said on the stumps in 1956, accusing Williams of being a Johnny come lately, catering only to the middle class. He accused him, he went into his book, Negro in the Caribbean, and pulled out all kinds of things which Williams had said. At the time, he was an academic. And uh, to, to denigrate uh, Williams and to um, undermine him in the image of uh, the people of Trinidad and Tobago as at that time. Yet he failed to diminish public appeal for the PNM. What happened? Remember that the PNM in 1956 won 39% of the votes. They won 13 seats, I think it was, but only they were a minority party. And they won essentially because they, 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 they dominated the urban areas, Port of Spain, San Fernando, or Rima but lost Tobago, lost in the eastern counties, lost in Carony, et etc. et cetera. So even though they had one power in 56, it was on a plurality rather than a majority basis. It was a normal hostility uh, that, that in all political situations developed between the old order and, 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 and the new. So it was not only Victor Bryan who was anti Eric Williams and the PNM, but one can say that whole cohort of politicians of the 40s and the 50s who saw you know, a new kid on the block. Here was Eric Williams coming with a completely different vision of where the country should go um, than, than, than what that, that older school had. So Victor Bryan was hostile, so was Albert Gums. So was Roy Joseph, so was Ajoda Singh, all of Ranjit Kumar, all of those, the Sinanan brothers, all of those who were pre-PNM politicians <coughs> would, in, in, in such a circumstance, become very hostile to any new person who comes with new and different ideas. And Eric Williams made it quite clear that he was for a new order and that he was not going to um, cohabit and, and be cooperative and friends with, with, with any of the older politicians whom he accused of a, a whole slew of all kinds of, of misdemeanors. So he, he distanced himself very clearly from Victor Bryan and his school of politics um, and, 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 and led a, a whole new movement, the PNM. Uh, and it would be surprising, therefore, if in such circumstances you could expect Brian or Gums or Norman Tang or Suresh Pat Matura or any one of them to be friendly with, with Williams. Politics doesn't, doesn't allow for that kind of, 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 of um, friendliness. It, 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 it breeds antagonism, particularly the kind of political system which we inherited. On Friday, January 3rd, 1958, the Federation became a reality. The historic moment marking the end of a long and eventful journey. The first murmurings for the Federation were heard in the 1930s. Now, 25 years later, the Federation had come, along with adult franchise and constitutional reform. But it came with no self-government. Self-government, though, was only a matter of time. Brian was under a different political party, the Democratic Labour Party of the West Indies, which fought for one of the ten seats allocated to Trinidad and Tobago in the federal parliament. Brian won the Eastern County seat, the old stronghold he would lean on again just for the federal elections. And so on Tuesday, March 25, 1958, he went to the federal parliament. In 1958, what happened was that the constituency boundaries had changed. Right, and uh, the PNM, I, I don't think they, they had done their homework on the basis of the constituencies as they were drawn. They couldn't win. They, they held on to what they had in 1956, but um, when you collapsed all the votes of all the other parties, the parties were in opposition, there was no way they could win. And Williams was, of course, very disenchanted, and you know what happened in that in 1958. He went and he made a speech uh, called The Dangers Facing Trinidad and Tobago. And he saw um, Hindu, what he considered to be Hindu fundamentalism 
as the great danger and he made that passionate speech which caused a lot of trouble because it upset a lot of people. The Federation limped along for the next three years, plagued with problems from leadership to finances. Some felt that Norman Manley should have assumed the role of Prime Minister of the Federation instead of Grantley Adams. Jamaica was shouldering 43% of the costs of the Federation and projected that costs would escalate to 46% over the next decade, roughly over a million pounds. In the Jamaica election in 1961, the cost for the Federation was a burning issue when the population voted that Jamaica should leave the Federation. In September 61, Jamaica did in fact leave, prompting Dr. Eric Williams' famous quote, one from ten leaves not. Three years later, Brian's political career had come to an end with the dissolution of the Federation. The Federation of the West Indies, that premature federation, was doomed to failure because there had been very little history of cooperation among the various colonies in the Caribbean. For example, if you wanted to go from Trinidad to Jamaica, you had to go to Miami, or you had to go to London and then take a flight. There were very few and far between um, flights from Trinidad to, 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 to Jamaica. And, 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 and the shipping routes all led to North America or Europe and not, not, not within the Caribbean. So all, and, and all of us who <coughs> were graduating from secondary schools at that time never really thought of, of a University of the West Indies. We all wanted to go to the United Kingdom. We wanted to go to to North America so that the, the perspective and the ambition of the young West Indian was not to remain in the West Indies, was to leave as, as, as quickly as possible because we didn't see the Caribbean region as, as offering any prospects for young persons. And, 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 and that is a bad precondition for a federation because when you have a federation, all the young people in that federation should long for and wish to be educated in, in the region and to remain in the region and to make their contribution towards the development of the whole region. And that kind of West Indian commitment among the elite, among the intellectual class, among the educated people was totally absent. What was very strong was a Trinidad nationalism, a Jamaica nationalism, a Barbados nationalism. And quite often that nationalism was chauvinistic in the sense that it was inwardly directed for ourselves alone and, and almost hostile to the, to, to the other um, colonies in, 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 in the region. So that feeling of oneness, that feeling of togetherness, that feeling of West Indianness was certainly not there in the, in, the, in the Federation. And I think it was one of the important reasons why all the smaller problems that arose later on um, did arise because they came out of the larger question of the absence of the preconditions for federation. He retired a forlorn man after such a devastating blow. Victor returned to his business which his wife Alma was administering while he was in politics. He would say, politics is too precarious a business to depend solely on it. Brian then started a quarry and brick factory. His contributions were also far-reaching. He was a freelance journalist at the Trinidad Guardian and advertising manager of the Daily Mirror, now defunct. His publications include the newspaper serials, A Guardian Gallery, and Current History of the Movies. He was an honorary member of the Farmers Club of Great Britain. Victor Bryan tried to revive his political career in 1966 when he ran for elections, but was unsuccessful. In 1936, Victor had married Alma Ayong, with whom he had three sons, Dave, Martin, and Anthony, and a daughter, Hazel. He would say that Alma was his most stalwart supporter, and they would stay up late at night strategizing around election time. As a father, he was a disciplinarian, but his children knew that he loved them tenderly. If I had three phases to describe Victor Bryan, I think they would be, first of all, he had an infectious sense of humor. Secondly, he was a loving family man. And thirdly, he was a very generous individual uh, with his friends. 
and certainly with his constituency when he was in politics. As a politician, he was outspoken. And I think as a family man, he was also outspoken. He would tell you where you went wrong and he would suggest how you could negotiate your way out of that. Um, he was by no means doctrinaire about anything. And I, I believe that although he had that outspokenness, he was a very balanced individual. He was loving and at the same time outspoken. And, and that is a trait that I think did him well and did us very well. His recreational interests were racing, tennis, horseback riding and swimming. His hobbies were writing and dancing. Victor Bryan was deemed one of the radical politicians of the late colonial period. He passed away on July 24, 1974. His significant contribution to Trinidad and Tobago paved the way for fundamental changes in the agricultural sector, trade unionism, and politics. I think, I think um, Bryan's role and his performance in the election is not generally known or understood by a lot of people. But I think he was a very colorful figure uh, who deserves to be resurrected and, and uh, presented to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I think his, his contribution was important. Um, for example, as, as I am now looking at, at that period, 50 to 56, because Williams painted it with a very dark, in, in very dark hues. You know, I, I, I think in the process he misrepresented uh, what those people did. Um, they had an imperfect constitutional instrument to work with, but within the framework, within the limitations, I, th I think they did extremely well. Um, Roy Joseph, for example, did a lot in terms of getting education facilities, educational facilities uh, for people like me who didn't win scholarships or didn't come from a particular social context. Brian was accused of selling out the people of the eastern uh, counties in terms of uh, what he was trying to do in terms of the cocoa industry. But I think they were progressives. And within the limits of the Constitution, I think they did remarkably well. And uh, it's a period that I think we need to revisit and understand uh, through eyes other than Williams. Where I think his major contribution stands out would be in, in the very good representation that he gave to his constituents in the Port of Spain City Council, the very good representation that he gave to his constituents in the Arima Borough Council. Those were the, his, his blooding grounds. Those were the, the areas in which he, he learned about politics and learned about interaction and, and, and how to move a motion and um, how to, how to behave in, in, a, in a parliamentary assembly. Okay, so that, so that I think he very significantly contributed to developments in those areas, the enhancement of Port of Spain, the enhancement of conditions in Arima, particularly infrastructure. And then, um, when he became a member of the Legislative Council, I think he generally improved agriculture throughout Trinidad and Tobago. Victor Bryan, truly and undeniably an outstanding parliamentary personality.